Hello, I am Tim, and I'm here to tend the Dahlia World Garden. Once again, it is Mage Monday, and we're moving right along uh, towards our debut of uh, our Mage the Ascension Chronicle Seattle at Dawn. And I've been working with my players, building their characters, finding out all their dirty little secrets. And one of the key aspects to Mage is magic, using magic. And regardless of the mage's source of power uh, or how they use it, the mechanics uh, that they use are the same. Um, the game system uh, uses a freeform magic system. Um, and it is both kind of exciting and scary and daunting. And there are things that are confusing. But we're going to help our players get right past that and uh, do the things that we're here to do. The fun awesome things we're here to cast spells we're here to be magic so first we're going to go over some terms just some basic things that'll help keep us from being too confused as we move forward um you don't need to know all of this hell i sometimes don't know all of it but i do my best um the first term that we're going to go over here uh, is Arate. Some pronounce it uh, Irite or Arate. Um, there are some very few that call it a reet, and they're all wrong. Um, or at least the ones that say it's a, a reet, that's wrong. But Arate um, is a special trait that all mages have um, that allow them to cast uh, an effect. Um, it's also known as Enlightenment if they are more of a technological um, mage, if they're not a mystic, but more of a technocracy, techno-mystic, or technocrat um, that believes in enlightened science. They're not going to call it Arate, they're going to call it something else. But for game purposes, it's all the same. We're going to stick to Arate at this point. Um, and the word magic uh, is kind of a... Uh, we're going to use that as kind of a phrase for freeform reality alteration. Um, things that are uh, magic that are done by the use of mage magical spheres of influence. Um, vampires and werewolves have access to all these magic powers, but they're not the same as a mages. They're all kind of codified into what they are. So when we're talking about magic in this case, it's not magic like how vampire will you know use mind mad uh, their mind abilities to influence the masses around them uh, or how they use the blood to make themselves stronger it's going to be more about how these mages use the spheres of influence um, and when we're talking about those spheres um, those are one of the nine traits that define what a mage can do with magic um, they're broken into the nine different categories of uh, life and mind and uh, entropy and, and so on. And we'll go over those a little bit more uh, detail in a moment. But just understand when we say sphere, uh, we're talking about one of those nine uh, influences uh, of reality. An effect uh, is basically your spells. Um, we want to kind of make sure that we're not doing too much in terms of like mystic calling and casting a spell because the technocrats are going to be uh, making effects using uh, what they call procedures. Uh, so it's not quite the same. Uh, but again, for our purposes, an effect uh, is uh, basically your, your spells. Um, it's also uh, known as workings. So some people will call it a working, uh, or a spell, or a procedure. Ultimately, we're concerned about what the effect is, the magic involved, how it is changing reality. There are these types of effects that are called rotes. Rotes are just a uh, planned or pre-made uh, effect. So if you, it's something that you've done before, something that you've practiced, something that you have down as a rote, so to speak. Um, it's not a fast cast 
spell. Um, so when we talk about um, casting spells, a mage will use what's called a focus. And a focus is kind of a combination of things. Um, it is a combination of their paradigm. So it's the how they view the world. It's their beliefs. Um, followed by um, their practices. How they how those beliefs become uh, the, 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 the rituals and the actions that they take to perform magic, their practices. Um, an example of a practice would be witchcraft. Uh, it could also be uh, hyper-economics or um, yoga, uh, voodoo. Um, basically, kind of the, uh, the, the trappings of how they are casting their magic. Um, it ties closely to what they believe sometimes, but it is um, one of the defining aspects of how that mage's magic works. A um, good example of a uh, like a witchy witchcraft practice um, is using a broom to fly. Um, they would have that belief that they can use the broom to fly and their practice uh, would be to possibly enchant that broom with certain charms and um, uh, incantations and then uh, using the calendar for a certain night um, that will uh, bring the right essence of the moon uh, that will allow them to cast that. Uh, so they perform the ritual and that practice is all different aspects of witchcraft that imbue that broom and the, the witch themselves with the ability to fly using it. Um, and all those little knickknacks and all those things that I described where they were using uh, the moon or uh, incantations and uh, incense and all those other things, that's going to be the instruments that a mage will use. Um, so those instruments, that practice, and the mage's paradigm all together create what we call focus. Uh, and without that the mage would not be able to change reality, would not be able to cast their effects until they're much more powerful. Um, but our mages in our game uh, aren't quite there yet. They still rely upon their instruments. Uh, interesting thing to also note is that when a mage or a technocrat is using their abilities, the more mystical mages tend to start shedding the instruments that they need faster. Um, their paradigm does revolve around the idea that they're changing reality, that they can make these big changes without uh, the normal methods. So they start figuring out how to do that earlier. Mages that rely on technology, um, their paradigm is that it's the technology, it's the science in the technology that's doing these effects. It's not something that's coming from them. So the te technical mages, those technomancers, they are not able to shed those devices as early um, as the mystic mages. Um, they eventually, if they get to a certain level, they eventually do get to um, shed those devices, but it takes a little longer. Um, next, this is a big one. In Mage, we have consensual reality. We have the idea that the masses figure out, or not figure out, the masses are the determining factors of how reality works. And mages really push against that. And when they push too hard uh, with their sphere magic, um, there's a thing called paradox. Um, it is the backlash of reality saying, you can't do that, and I'm going to punish you for trying. Um, a mage can get paradox in a variety of different ways, um, but typically it's when they try to do something beyond what reality will normally allow. Um, a good rule of thumb, I hate that phrase, uh, a good rule to kind of stick by a guideline is that if the effect a mage is trying to do uh, would not cause an a onlooker to go, 
that's impossible, then it's probably fine. It's what would be considered coincidental magic, um, which is an effect that the average person would consider possible. Um, whereas if it's not, where it looks like the effect that the average person would consider impossible, like you try to do, do this and it's so fantastic that it defies all rational explanation, that's going to be what's called vulgar magic. And vulgar magic brings a lot more paradox. Um, so beware of that if you're casting spells. Um, recognize that many uh, many mages have perished uh, for trying to uh, reach beyond their limits. Uh, and paradox has been the cause of that. There is, in the nine spheres, uh, there are some spheres that are a little bit more tangible. Um, they, they are part of reality. Uh, forces matter life. And to a lesser degree, the spirit sphere. Uh, these are called the pattern spheres. They are basically um, the... Uh, what's the word? They're, they're the spheres that influence our reality more directly. Um, they are they create things of substance. Um, often are fueled by what's called quintessence. Um, everything that lives has quintessence built in it. Uh, every spirit, every um, every object has some quintessence, and quintessence is the energy that creatures of uh, 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 that creates and fuels all things. Um, there's a specific sphere of magic called prime that deals with that. Um, and in combination with the pattern spheres, um, you can do things like conjure something from nothing um, or drain something of its energy and to the point where it does disintegrate. Uh, you could also do that same thing with entropy and we'll talk about that as well. Um, conjunctional effects, what I'm talking about here, um, that uses two or more spheres together. So that's a good kind of primer of what we're going to be talking about. Basically, knowing um, these these terms will help uh, figure out what I'm talking about while I continue. Um, so at this point, so now I think a good idea is to figure out what I mean by the spheres. Um, we've got nine different spheres of magic. They all kind of correspond to different parts of reality. Um, but in order, we're going to talk about what they can do. And then we're going to, in general, talk about uh, the different degrees, different levels that you can do. Um, so the first... The first sphere um, is uh, correspondence. Um, it's a really strange name. It's not. It's it, especially for what it connects, and it'll make more sense here in a second. Um, because it is correspondence is the influence over connections and dimensions. Um, it specializes in conjuration, scrying, uh, opening up gates, and warding against. Um, unwanted uh, intrusion uh, teleportation it is the magic of manipulating space manipulating and not necessarily space but more the connection between one location and another the correspondence if you will um, of these different points um, some people We'll view it as an illusion where we think all things are one and always connected and, and touching. And the correspondence is a method of going from one of those quote unquote points to another point. Um, it is useful for um, casting magic at a distance, uh, for casting spells and effects that are... Um, 
force uh, affecting somebody further away, like if they were on the other side of the world, uh, that correspondence, that connection, uh, you have a, a piece, a lock of their hair or uh, some significant item to them. Those connections can help with casting those effects. So correspondence is important. Um, it's definitely a uh, bit of a tropish type um, because a lot of magic in media and in storytelling is that you know the wizard is looking at or scrying on somebody at a distance, um, or they are <clears throat> using a voodoo doll uh, to hurt a person from from a distance. So correspondence certainly fits within those concepts. The next fear is entropy. Entropy is a um, is the sphere of chance and mortality. Um, it specializes in fate and fortune and decay and um, the um, spectrum of order and chaos. Um, it also is used in necromancy, especially when when how when used as a conjunctional effect with necromancy uh, with life. One second here, Do something. Okay. So life and entropy, necromancy. Sorry, had to check something over here. Anyway, it can oftentimes be used to alter probabilities. So if you're a gambler and you want to win at uh, craps or, or poker or any game, or the slots, the use of an entropy effect is likely what you're going to be using. It's going to um, make that uh, die, those two dice roll up a seven. Uh, it's going to make the slot machine... Uh, roll and get that unprobability, unprobable outcome. Um, using it this way too often, uh, as you can suspect, will uh, push the boundaries of what is considered possible. So paradox uh, can slowly build up if you're using a lot of little entropy effects. Um, it also can, when uh, coupled with matter, um, break something down. You can cause a uh, steel beam to rust. Um, you can find weak points in an object. So you can use entropy for that um, ability as well. So entropy is pretty cool. Um, the next sphere um, is going to be the one that uh, causes the most disruption. It is the um, it is the flashy magic it is called forces um, and it is the magic of alchemy and motion and, and the elements um, it's what fuels our technology in terms of uh, electricity um, it is the magic of physics um, so uh, and weaponry and weather it encompasses quite a lot honestly um, it is uh, scarily um, powerful, um, and it will always bring the disaster, if you will. It lasers, fire, wind, uh, like I said, lightning, uh, nuclear fission. Uh, you are um, you are kind of the master of the physical, uh, or not the 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 more energetic side of reality and it's it's it, it like i said it covers a lot and usually it's tempered by a mage's paradigm a mage who is um more mystical is not going to make a bomb uh, they're going to just cast fireball um so they're not using nuclear fission anything like that um to fuel their their spells but a technocrat might find radioactivity as a great battery source and use that um, to fuel their machinery 
And so that's where um, things kind of separate into, you know, real world physics and forces. It's, it's interesting because, you know, if we actually look at our, you know, how the way we understand the world, uh, it really has moved very far in this past century. And this game, uh, though it is almost 30 years old at this point, um, but even then in the 90s, we still didn't have um, at least a more, like like more people today have a more lay, uh, a layman's idea of nuclear physics and how uh, the quantum world works. Because we've had it explained to us in our media and our movies and uh, YouTube. We've just, you know, we've learned a lot more uh, as a culture uh, that the scientists probably knew, you know, decades ago but forces is this weird catch-all of elemental magic which we know in normal physics wouldn't really work you know ice is not an element um the, you know, neither is fire or earth you know these are uh concepts of elements but forces still deals with those um as well as the quantum physics of, of the world. So it's uh, um, it's an interesting uh, sphere, to say the least, and it can go a lot of different directions depending on how uh, the individual mage perceives that. And we should also mention um, here, well, we'll get to it. I'll get to it. I'll circle back. The next big sphere, the next sphere of influence uh, is life. Um, and it has purview uh, over all living forms. Uh, it specializes in transformation, shape-shifting, healing, uh, bodily improvement, uh, creation of life, cloning, evolution, uh, and causing harm, injury to living forms. This is the, you know, if you're, if you're going to be uh, any type of healing mage, or if you want to do anything that affects a living person, you're going to want to have this sphere. The witch that wants to uh, heal somebody's wounds, or uh, the progenitor technocrat who wants to uh, improve the, the human genome, this, this is all going to be done through life. Um, at earlier levels of it, all you can really do is uh, sense and kind of feel how life is around you. Um, you can get a sense of something, whether it's healthy or unhealthy. Uh, but as you grow in this sphere, um, you can start making alterations to other life forms, lesser life forms, and then start making alterations to yourself. And then at higher forms of this uh, sphere, you're able to start making alterations in other people as well. And then eventually you're able to make people. Um, so it, it can, can be pretty wild on how um, this sphere works. The next sphere is another of the pattern spheres, like we were talking about, forces, life, and now matter. Matter is the shaping of materials. It's, it's got specialties with transmutation, uh, alchemy, uh, as well. Um, it's also shaping, conjuration uh, works in it, refinement, and more complex patterns. When you've got a, uh, you know, you've got elements that are basic like iron and steel, but then you start at higher levels of this, of this ability, you'd be able to make things like vibranium and adamantium. And I start adding those type of elements to uh, some truly wild uh, physical uh, things so complex patterns and obviously maybe not so obvious uh would definitely uh pair very well with using quintessence to make those complex patterns um refinement you're able to uh, get something distilled to its core element and um with transmutation being able to change lead to gold um that very classic alchemy sort of thing so matter very important. I'm going to say that about all. They're all very important. And that makes sense. All nine of them are 
important aspects of quote unquote reality. After matter, we have the mind. Mind, the mind sphere uh, influences the art of consciousness. So uh, communication, uh, illusions, emotion, social programming, uh, self-empowerment, astral travel. So if you were um, looking to venture into the high umbra, this is the sphere that you would use to do so. Um, mind shielding, uh, psychodynamics and psychic combat um, are all purviews under the mind. Um, and mind can be used with other uh, effects as well. This is not a pattern sphere. This is uh, dealing with consciousness. And when we're talking about consciousness in, in this world, in mage, um, it's not everything that's tied to your brain. There's, there is the consideration of the human spirit, the soul, um, that is influenced and controlled by the spirit sphere. We'll get to that. But mind is this kind of consciousness-driven um, element. It's as intangible as uh, the prime sphere or the spirit sphere. Um, it doesn't necessarily... Um, jive with our real world understanding of how the brain works um so uh, mind is a, a bit more uh metaphysical and that makes sense this is mage everything's metaphysical right um moving on from the mind we have the prime sphere prime as i like to describe it is kind of the magic of magic um Quintessence is the fifth element. It is the uh, aspect that makes everything real, very real. Um, and prime is that essence of all things. So the specialties are, are resonance. Like what is the flavor of somebody's magic um, is detectable by prime, is controlled or can be manipulated by prime. Uh, artifice, if you're looking to create something from nothing prime you're, you're dragging that quintessence energy and transforming it into one of the pattern spheres so you're creating a a living frog or you're creating a imbued metal or you're creating um a fire from nothing um it's a works with channeling so if you're looking like the idea of uh recce or uh, energy transference, quintessence is a big part of that. Um, and also creation and destruction. At the higher levels, it is absolutely the force behind everything. Um, it is very hard to define what Prime is, um, but game mechanic-wise, it is um, surprisingly one of the most overlooked spheres. Um, but also at the same time, one of the more useful um, in that it'll, with Prime uh, Sphere, you can manipulate Quintessence and allows you to make your spells, your effects easier. It can allow you to make um, things uh, resistant to aggravated damage. You can cause uh, something to, to cause aggravated damage. So these types of... Uh, effects with prime can really go a long way and really does bring that ethereal magic uh to the to your game another hard to pin down uh sphere is spirit um but spirit comes down to you know kind of the uh, magics or the influence of things outside of our material world we've got our material world that we experience, we view in the pattern spheres of uh, forces, life and magic or matter are all kind of observant and, and we feel them and they're there. Um, and spirit is anything outside of that. So you have the umbra, the, the near umbra um, or penumbra, which is uh, just the other side of the of the gauntlet. Um, probably a term I should have defined earlier, but um, we'll just say that that's the the curtain between the reality, our reality, and all the other realities. And spirit deals with those. So uh, travel through the spirit realms, 
uh, dealing with spirits, um, which do exist, um, dealing with angels and demons and aliens and nature spirits. It is a very big tent that spirit covers. And magically speaking, it, if you're coming from a shamanistic uh, worldview, everything has a spirit. And so everything that you do with your magic should include the spirit's fear. Uh, it's able to do so much, especially if you travel outside of the material, realm, uh, material plane. Spirit can keep you alive. It can help you deal with other uh, entities that you come across um, and even navigate um, those um, very strange and otherworldly places. So spirit can come in handy. The final and ninth sphere um, is time. I don't think I have to explain what time is. I think we've all experienced it. Um, but time is all about the time sphere is is all about uh, tricking the flow, if you will. So um, having perceptions of the past and the future, um, that that um, prophecy, um, setting up uh, triggers on a temporal state. So if you want a magic effect to occur later in time then that's when you would want to do that um, you would set that up to uh, you would set that up and that would be your uh, your trigger uh, through the time sphere Yeah, time sphere would uh, allow you to set a condition or to affect later. Um, I had a bit of a time bubble there. I apologize. I had to fix something. So then you also have um, time travel. Uh, very, very dangerous. Time travel uh, and any real control over time will garner way more paradox than almost any other effect. Time is one of those um, elements of existence that we have a hard time wrapping our heads around. And consensual reality is also that. Reality says X happens because Y happened, because Z happened, because it, and it's a string of events. And we can't wrap our heads around any other way of that being. So anytime you take make an element and using time magic that changes that uh paradox really comes back to haunt you um consensual reality is not going to uh, agree with you on that and so time is very dangerous i've had mages do some very awesome things but they've also had to suffer that uh the consequences of messing with time And those are the nine spheres of magical influence. There are alternative versions uh, that techno mages and the uh, might use, but it all comes down to roughly the same principles. So I don't necessarily think that I'm going to need to go by and explain the difference between correspondence and what a virtual adept would call data. Um, as far as game mechanics go, a lot of it's about the same. Whew! That's a lot. Um, when you're looking at your spheres and casting magic with those spheres, there is a degree of control and understanding so for example every sphere and we'll say correspondence you have correspondence uh, sphere 
every every one of the spheres is divided into different rankings uh, from rank one to rank five um, and the higher the ranking the more powerful you are in that sphere um, that's not too difficult to understand but what we want to talk about is each rank and what it basically can do so if you're rank one uh, your understanding of that sphere is is through perception uh, you have the ability to perceive and observe the forces in question. Um, very basic but useful understanding. Uh, you can sense things that most mortals don't recognize. So rank one, a lot of people look at it and say, well, I can't do a whole lot. But just being able to perceive things and react to those things can really be the difference between life and death. Um, or... Uh, getting promoted or not. Um, the it, Magical perception can certainly influence a mage's life. It's, it's slow. It's, it's a, it's a low-key thing. It's not going to uh, drastically change everything. But, again, just having that perception makes a universe of difference. But then you get a little better at it. You become uh, stronger with your arte, and you start understanding the concepts a bit more and you move into rank two rank two is manipulation manipulation meaning that you have the ability to to, to do small things with those forces um your mage begins to exert minor control uh over the phenomenon that they see um and they can use it to work small changes upon themselves so for example a life mage may be able to with a uh, rank in two uh, life would be able to you know re-energize themselves they would be able to uh, not stave off the effects of sleep uh, deprivation a bit longer than somebody else with a bit more understanding you can move into rank three and rank three is about control um, you have the ability to alter reality in noticeable ways. It's usually restricted to the mage themselves. They can't affect too much, but they are outside the, you know, they are able to, um, start inflicting damage, um, at this level. So usually prior to rank three, it's difficult to cause direct harm with magic. Um, or with the spheres. At this point, it's actually quite easy. Um, and you're able to start working small alterations on other characters. So uh, at this rank, you're starting to be able to heal other people instead of just yourself. With rank four, um, that's command. The ability to perform major arts or major acts of alteration through the principles of the sphere. Um, this level allows a mage to make significant changes uh, to the patterns of other characters. So at this point, you would be able to um, change somebody's hand into a flipper. Um, or um, if you were using conjunctional magic, you could be able to um, change somebody's hair into fire. Um, <coughs> that's a very vulgar effect. Uh, expect paradox to come down on you hard. Um, but you could do it. Then finally, you've got rank five, mastery. Um, and I say finally, because if you go beyond rank five, you're usually in the arch master territory. You are um, so powerful that you probably shouldn't be a player character anymore. You are now influencing big, big uh, parts of the world. Um, so, but we're not going to worry about that because our mages, if they get above five, um, I'm going to want them to make a new character because five's, you know, if you get beyond that, it gets boring. You're too powerful. You're like Superman. Now I'm going to get a whole lot of people thinking that I hate Superman. I don't. Superman's awesome. All right. But mastery, uh, rank five, uh, you have the ability to command vast forces in connection to that element of reality. And at this point, uh, the mage knows almost everything there is about the principles of that sphere. 
um, and they can perform some truly godlike deeds. Um, so that's from rank one to rank five, all the different spheres of influence, those things all together, either separately within their own spheres or combined, is where you can go with, with magic, with these effects. Sphere, sphere effects. Ah, I can't talk today. Sphere effects. And that's all fine and dandy. But how do you cast an effect? In the game, as I was saying earlier, the process is the same. And it comes in some basic steps. This can get complicated. Um, and it can get kind of messy. It is certainly more of an art than an exact science. Some of this becomes subjective and up to the rule of cool. Um, or sometimes just the, you know, storyteller saying, I don't interpret this this way. You can't do that. I, as a storyteller, try not to enter that realm. I am uh, by no means uh, an expert in all all things, but uh, what I do understand in this game, I can work with and say, yes, that's possible, no, that's possible, or what I tend to say is, yes, you can do this. However, here are the consequences. Because sometimes cool is cool, and you want your players to have fun, and it makes more sense in a story for you to say yes than it does to say no. So, taking it with a grain of salt, uh, when I'm running a mage game, I do my best to stick to these rules, but every once in a while, because that's the nature of reality in mage, something happens that's not supposed to. So step one. Step one, when you are trying to cast a magical effect, is to define what it is that you want to accomplish. You can say, I want to uh, make this person fall in love with me. I want to um, cast a, a ball of fire and throw it at somebody. I want to program my a specialized laser rifle to send a pulse of energy that will stun a person instead of kill them. All of these are magical effects and defining what you're doing will help you figure out which spheres of magic that you will be using to do so. So the major question will tell the storyteller what they want to do. And sometimes it's a pre-planned thing. It's something that they've already done. They've got a rote uh, of, I've figured out how to do this and I've written it down and I'm doing X, um, which can be a boon for all storytelling because it's something that this character is, it's a signature almost. And it's something that you can make work. Um, then step two, after you've figured out what you wanna do, and what spheres you're going to use um, is more of the, uh, figuring out can you do it. Um, so, again, with the roots, you've probably already figured out that you can do it. But step two, if you're doing freeform, again, this is a freeform magic system, so oftentimes um, you got to figure this, these things out on the fly. So, the first part of this is how does your character's focus and practice make this happen? Hold on one second. Got a bit of a here. Huh. Okay. Well, the stream's still going. Just looks like my record. It's going to go off. No worries. I'm going to keep going. We're going to keep talking about this until we, uh, until we uh, go horse. But no, 
you figure out is this something that your character believes they can do and how do they propose going about doing it so in the previous example of a witch using a broom to fly in the paradigm of that witch yes they can do that and they will um, put into place the practices and instruments to make that happen the next step is what tools and rituals are are the mage using and that's that comes down to your uh, instruments um, so the broom the charms the uh, evocations those are all going to go into making that broom capable of flight and you want to figure out how long that is going to take some fast acting uh, mages can do have some things pre-planned and prepped so they can do a, a spell effect in a single turn or if it's a ritual they may have to spend multiple turns doing that um, and then determining is the spell effect vulgar or coincidental depending on how your practices how the mages practices are being use is going to determine if that is a coincidental or vulgar effect um and again it all comes down to if somebody's watching you and they're not magical at all would they believe it's possible and then you go vulgar or coincidental based on that there are skills that you can use to make a certain ability easier so you can if you're using martial arts as a focus correctly performing that action that martial arts uh, kata or that punch or whatever it is that you're trying to do um, with your mundane skills that will influence the difficulty of the spell the spell um, so once you have that you know what you want to do you figure out, yes, you can do it, and if it's going to be vulgar or coincidental, you then roll for the successes. You roll, you, you roll to see if you're capable, or see if you actually perform what you want to do. And this is a roll of your Arate rating. Arate um, is going to range. Uh, some mages have one, two, three, four, five, whatever. Um, but you're going to roll that number of dice and you're going to want to reach a certain difficulty rating um, on the die um, the minimum difficulty for magic is always going to be three um, so you don't necessarily need to um, roll very high on some things very easy effects so for example if it's a coincidental effect your difficulty is going to be whatever the highest sphere in your effect is required so if you're healing somebody else you're going to require three life um, the difficulty for that action is going to be six so you're going to want to roll your arate and you want to get as many sixes or higher to make that effect work if it's a vulgar effect say it's being done and it it's definitely would be looked at as impossible and you don't have any witnesses by witnesses i mean sleeper witnesses those who are not magical beings then the difficulty is the highest sphere plus four so a little more difficult um, so instead of being six it would be seven uh, and then if you're doing this effect with witnesses and it's vulgar um, the difficulty is the highest sphere plus five. So in our example of healing somebody, if you're doing it with, with a, in, a, in a method that is vulgar and you've got somebody watching you, it's going to be eight. It's going to be a higher difficulty. And eight is a lot harder to roll than, or eight higher is higher, is eight or higher is harder to roll than six or higher. As you're casting, however, you do have the ability to add and subtract modifiers. I, as the storyteller, will add in complications that make the 
uh, casting dif more difficult. Say, for example, you're in a uh, region where the resonance is opposite of yours, um, or the paradigm uh, is incredibly technological. So you're in the middle of a high-tech hospital. Um, your voodoo magic is going to be more difficult to uh, do. So I would raise the difficulty by one, um, or two, or three, depending. Um, could also be that you're trying to cast spirit magic, and the gauntlet is is um, weak there. So I would give you a uh, modifier of negative two because it's easier to cast spirit magic in that area. Um, you also have at this time the ability to spend willpower or quintessence, depending on uh, what you like. Uh, spending a willpower gets you an automatic success. Um, spending quintessence lowers the difficulty of your spells. So in the case of the let's say casting this healing spell on somebody um it's vulgar but you don't have anybody uh witnessing you so normally the difficulty would be seven however you're gonna channel quintessence into the spell to make it easier and you've got a um you've got the ability to channel up to three quintessence so you do you spend you spend the three quintessence and you do the spell that lowers the difficulty from seven down to four makes it much more easier to get more successes so once you get all this together and you determine what you want to do heal somebody that you can do it you have three life and that you want to make it less difficult by spending three quintessence you roll your RT rating in this case let's say it's three so you roll three 10-sided dice, and you want to reach a four or higher on any of those dice. And you get two four, uh, you get a five, a seven, and a two. That counts as two successes, and those successes will roll into how well you've healed that person. Now, in this particular case, uh, the two successes equates to two levels of health. Um, so you would be able to heal somebody uh, for that. Now, if you got three successes, that would have been six levels of health um, because it does kind of grow and become exponentially more powerful with more successes. Um, and that is the first three steps. The next step, as I kind of got ahead of myself, is step four, the results, what happens. And that's going to be, again, based on the charts and the and all the stuff that I have in front of me, uh, we'll determine how much healing is performed. Um, we'll also determine that since it's a vulgar spell, um, how much uh, paradox comes into play here. Um, a successful casting of a vulgar spell gets you one point of paradox. Um, if you're... Uh, so you get that. Um, if you failed, um, the spell effects fizzle. Um, and if you succeed, or sorry, if you botch, say you have no successes and you roll ones anywhere, uh, then you would get, uh, in this case, one point of paradox and one point of paradox per dot in your highest sphere so that would be four points of paradox in this case if you had witnesses that paradox would have been worse you would have gained two paradox plus two for every sphere so double that so instead of four you would have gotten eight paradox and as a storyteller if you end up garnering, uh, collecting more than five paradox, then I, as a storyteller, I start rolling for paradox effects for backlash. And that's where the danger comes when you're not casting coincidental effects or taking into account that um, magic is more difficult and dangerous 
with vulgar effects. That's all theory. Talked a lot about it, but uh, our next aspect is going to be magical feats. We're going to talk a little bit here about like degrees of success. Not going to get too granular here because that's going to get kind of wonky. But the more successes you roll when you roll your Arte, the um, grander the effects you can can do. A simple feat would only re typically require um, one success. So things like changing your hair color, things that affect you and only you and are very simple. A standard feat, um, like conjuring a small fire, healing yourself, some pretty basic little things, two successes. Um, oh no, kitty cat, that's my familiar. <laughs> Three successes would be required for more difficult feats, um, such as conjuring that giant fireball or healing aggravated damage. Um, four successes would typically be required for very impressive feats, um, like re regrowing uh, an arm after it's been cut off um, or uh, changing somebody to a different shape. Um, those things are very difficult and require more successes. Um, then you start getting into mighty feats, uh, that are range between five and 10 successes. And that's creating a simple life form. Um, but then an outlandish feat, uh, would be 10 to 20 successes. And that's, uh, creating a complex life form or blowing up a building or summoning otherworldly creatures requires way more successes. And in magic, you can, pr you can do rituals that take time so that you can start collecting those successes. Um, so even though it may not be something that you can cast on the fly, it is something that if you wanted to do and you had the time, you could potentially still do some of these outlandish, even godlike feats. Um, like, for example, if you were... Uh, wanting to change a part of yourself, like you wanted to give yourself wings, and you wanted that to be a permanent part of your body um, and not be rejected and that. You would want to garner more than 20 successes. And you'd also have to deal with the permanent paradox of having wings. But you would definitely uh, need to use some sort of ritual because you're not going to be able to get 20 successes with a single roll. One of the things that is interesting uh, when you're casting is figuring out what you're doing and how you're doing it. And then uh, getting the modifier correct here. Um, if you were using your instruments, for example, as a mage, it does become easier if you're making, uh, if you're using your wand that is one of your instruments, uh, the difficulty instead of being the six or whatever, like we were talking about for the healing, it would be five because of that difficulty modifier. <sighs> Also, if you're spending quintessence and anything like that. We've got a lot of uh, different modifiers um, that uh, I will be using when we're playing the game um, to, to affect that difficulty. One of the useful uh, charts in the in the mage 20 guide and I want to have all my players reference this and have it easily accessible um, not just for themselves but for me um, is going over the different 
um, common magical effects. And we're going to use this to try and figure out maybe some some spells or effects that uh, a mage might want to use. Um, so I'm going to bring up an example, and we're going to create some spells um, or effects, magical effects, um, for one of my newer characters in the game, one of my NPCs. He's, uh, he's the youngest and newest member of the uh, cabal known as the Geek Squad. Um, they are four techno mages. They all specialize in some form of uh, techno mystical um, effects. And the Geek Squad will um, be part of our story here. And the youngest member is Tyler Milner. Tyler Miller also goes by the name of Amp. The I'll try to pull up my here we go. So here is the basic character sheet for Tyler. Um, like I say he goes by the name Amp. He is a uh, a audio video file he is uh young and energetic he's very fond of uh media uh both old and new he looks like this guy right here he's very pleasant very well groomed um, kind of has a bit of a um, innocence to him that uh is a bit uh, unusual for the affiliation. He is a member of the Cult of Ecstasy. Um, and he found his uh, enlightenment, his awakening uh, through media. And the euphoric experiences for him in music um, and also uh, movies. He really liked having a crisp, clear picture and amazing 7.1 surround sound uh, around him and this has kind of moved him into more of the technical side of things than the <coughs> more um, druggy um, tropes that you find with the uh, Sahajia or the Cult of Ecstasy as they used to be known Looking over these basic uh, stats here, Amp is charismatic and he's very good looking. Above average intelligence, but he's definitely into that media um, element. He's very good with technology, um, which is expected considering that he is a member of uh, this techno magical support crew. Um, and he is not very powerful compared to some other members of the crew. He's got some very basic magical understandings, his fears. Uh, he's got rank 2 in correspondence, rank 1 in prime, rank 2 in matter, rank 2 in forces, and then rank 1 in time. So he's got... Uh, Two of the pattern spheres um, he's getting very good at and correspondence so he's got a good understanding of space and how things connect. He is still very early in his learning of quintessence and and how time works. But he can make some pretty awesome things this way and we can work with this so we can make some rotes that he commonly uses um he carries around a backpack that has some tools in it and some uh scanners and devices that help him uh, determine the um, energy and acoustics in a room that helps him determine um, 
like when he builds a circuit board, what where to put the circuitry, the, the transistors, the resistors, all that, um, to make the best of his effects in mind. So, looking at the origin of the character, that he is um, somebody who wants to, I mean, who uses technology, and that he is uh, focused on media, um, I would say he probably wants to sometimes throw a good party. He wants to have a good, uh, good light show. Um, so he wants to be a DJ and put on a good, good show. Um, but where, where he's going, he doesn't necessarily always have all his tools. So he wants to, uh, fix the lighting so that it works for him and creates a, um, a better experience for those around him. Um, he's not going to be able to directly affect their minds or their bodies because he doesn't have any mind magic or life. But he can create some pretty convincing um, effects. So with his ability in matter and forces, he can get up. Looking through the chart here, seeing if there's any options here that goes correspond with what I'm thinking. Might not be. All right. So here's what here's what we got. Yeah. So forces controls both light and sound and he's looking to purify the experience. Um whether that be at a club or somebody's home audio setup, he will use his expertise to um, manipulate the forces that are being generated by, say, a home audio system, or even the audio system in the uh, in the club, to be as pure and as as perfect as 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 the source. Uh, no losses in configuration. No no problem like that. So we follow our steps. What does he want to do? He wants to have the purest possible audio quality. And the spheres that he's using is Forces 2. Um, and at Forces 2, he can. So we can determine that he can do this. And that he's going to be using his uh, tools that are in his um, his backpack. That That's a specialized kit that he's put together that fits within his paradigm of technology being you know what he's working with and it could be a ritual it could be something that we're looking to do um this would be like a let's say it's a difficult feat um so it's going to require three successes and that could be difficult for him because he only has two arate so when he does the the spell it's not going to get three successes no matter how good he rolls uh, so it's definitely going to have to be multiple rolls that he casts. But that's perfectly fine because this can be, like I said, ritualized as, you know, doing maintenance or repair work on the equipment that in question. So uh, by combining his matter and forces knowledge, this is, this is the effect that he's going for. So... 
Yeah. So we're going to add this. So the fear is used. We're going to add forces to, and we're also going to say matter to. May not necessarily be required, but um, for him, in his particular paradigm, how he goes about doing this, matter does make the most sense. And we we'll call this uh, purify audio. Basically, it gets all the cracks and digital pops out of out of a song and makes it um, pleasant to to work with. Uh, so, um, oops. oops. And he uses uh, his backpack, like I said, he's got his tools. Uh, one particular instrument is going to be his, um, we can make this up as we go, um, almost like a uh, Doctor Who-esque sonic screwdriver, Let's, uh, but obviously uh, way more technical. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, we could call it like a... Uh, uh, Ah, I don't even know, uh, digital balance or, or a a yeah, yeah so we'll call it a uh, system diagnostic system diagnostic and optimization tool. So it's going to require three successes in general. As a um, as a difficult feat. And of course, that can change depending on uh, in the depending. On, well, the successes aren't going to change because it's again the feat of you know making uh, the audio stream from source to uh, output perfect um, as it is. That's going to take some time. So, or that's going to that's going to take some power. So that's always going to require at least three successes. Um, if you go, if he he manages to get more successes. Um, which is possible if he's doing multiple roles. Um, that will um, will be using a um, optional rule. Basically, uh, those additional successes will um, either add to the number of targets, or the amount of damage, or the duration of the effect. Um, so uh, each additional uh, success could add to any of those. Um, but this is a very simple. Uh, idea um, for amp as he amps up the audio so to speak here um, and then is this vulgar or coincidental if we're if we're going through the rule sets here this is going to be a coincidental effect most people will see this as technology as a uh, as somebody helping them so I'm going to add in here that this is a coincidental effect um, So purify audio, forces to, matter to, removes impurities from the data stream, uh, from the source to the speaker by uh, balancing the energies of the input output. Um, 
uses the system diagnostic and optimization tool of his design. And it requires three successes and it is co coincidental um, magical effect. And that's, that's the spell. So basic idea, it's got that. Sets up, we set it up as a rote. So when we're going through our, so if he wants to cast this, this is going to be a coincidental effect that uses two um, degrees of forces and also two matter, but doesn't, in this case, both of them are the same. So it's the highest of the highest of uh, the spheres you're using. So it's going to be two plus three for a difficulty of five. Um, so that's space difficulty. Um, I'm also going to, in the road section, say base difficulty. And we'll put that in the in the description here. That way, it's easy to catch. So base difficulty. We'll just say base diff equals um, in this case five, because that's going to be so. In all all things being equal, in just a normal setting, normal circumstance, uh, when amp uses this effect, it's base difficulty five. Um, now he's going to usually take time to do this um, and this is an effect that let's give uh, some basic uh, rules here um, let's say the ritual requires um an hour and within that hour he's able to roll every 15 minutes so each roll is 15 minutes of work in terms of the ritual uh, that means that he can in the course of an hour get four rolls and if it if he doesn't garner any successes within those four rolls then the effect, you know, doesn't work. If he gets the three required successes, then the effect works. And it may even be that he makes it work within half an hour. Um, so, for example, here we'll say, well, let's 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 roll some dice. Let's see what happens. Um, he's not willing to spend any quintessence uh, or willpower um, because this is not a life or death situation. So he's not trying to um, save someone's life or his own. He is, however, using one of his uh, instruments. So instead of being uh, the difficulty of five, that actually lowers it down to four. Um, so with a difficulty of four, he is going to roll two dice at a time. I'm going to throw some virtual dice here. See how that goes. And say a number of dice two. Variable target number. Uh, like we were saying, the difficulty on this is going to be four instead of five. So that rolls. Got a 10 and a nine, two successes. Now, as a storyteller, I would have the player um, describe what they're doing and how their magic is working. But in this case, they still haven't garnered the amount of successes to achieve the effect. They still have some more work to do. So, they have gone through the first 15 minutes. Things are going well. With a roll of 9 and a 10, that's really good. Um, so far, looking at the system... AMP has been able to find exactly where the problems lie and has started to move towards uh, repairing the stream from the source to this, the output. So then he rolls his next set. And again, same difficulty, same dice. And he rolls two sevens. That is... Uh, two more successes. He now has four successes and he is now able to 
let the effect go. So the effect starts working its magic on the speaker systems and is now um, got one extra success as well. So not only does he fix the audio problems and make the audio perfect, but he's also going to um, add that extra level of uh, that one extra die of success um, to increase the duration of this uh, spell. So normally the duration for this would be for a scene, but with this additional success, he is able to uh, move it to one full day. So his uh, his uh, casting of this spell will affect this audio and make the audio perfect for the full day. If he wanted to keep going, for example, because four successes, yeah, that's great, but uh, he wants this effect to actually last longer than the day. He's actually been contracted to make this work, um, to make this work um, really well. So he's going to um, try to get actually um, two more successes um, because he wants to get, extend it from the one theme to six months. So he's got two more rolls that he can roll and he can figure out how that works. So he rolls a four and a seven, which is two more successes. He now has six total successes. He's still one shy of his goal of making this last for six months. Um, let's see if he can do that. And there we go. Another four and an eight. This magic ritual has gone perfect. In fact, so perfect that um, even though he's, he, spent the, he spent time, he had the whole hour, and he's working with this audio system and all of us and it comes down to the effects coming from the source to the output is always perfect it is there's no crackle no delay no um no distortion uh everything is perfect and will remain that way for six months and that's why he's a member of the geek squad because he can go out there and fix your shit So that's an example of using magic in a real world scenario in a real world job. And that's, that's what Amp is doing. He's going out and making these changes to people's lives and their equipment. Going to... What other effects do you think that we could do with with AMP? Something a little bit more exciting. Something that is a little bit more um, befitting a story that uh, can sometimes get you in danger. So if he's in danger and he needs to protect himself, what can he do? Well, let's see. He's got... Two dots in correspondence, two dots in matter, one, uh, two in forces, one in prime, one in time. So, with two in forces, actually, let's let's go back even better. He's let's say. He wants to he wants to be invisible he wants to be able to not be seen so that he can escape properly so 
making oneself invisible or creating a field of invisibility around you does require two forces. Um, so let's yeah so let's 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 write out a rote that he has because he sometimes gets himself into some trouble here. So he's going to use forces two. He's going to create a shield of invisibility. But he's not going to call it that. Because for him, this isn't magic. This is science and technology. And this is working with those principles that he's very fond of. The idea of media. So, um, media-wise, um, he's going to look at it a little bit more like a cloaking device. Um, almost like the Predator. Um, so he's going to try and uh, mask his uh, radiant energy. He's going to try and mask his um, the radio waves coming off of him. So, he's going to call it a cloaking device. And this cloaking device is uh, integrated into his backpack. Um, he's had some scary close um, calls with the technocracy, so he's uh, gone through the trouble of um, weaving this effect um, into his backpack um, using his, his uh, technomatic tools. So. Um, So we're talking about invisibility now. This is forces two. I'm gonna double check here and see what that can do here. So, he's capable of bending the light around him. He's able to take these forces, uh, forces two, and create an effect that bends light around his uh, person. Uh, so... So I'm going to say that inside the backpack, Amp has uh, installed an optical emitter um, that he can modify and work with on the fly. Um, when he, uh, by uh, reversing the polarity, because this is, I love techno babble like that, and so does he. He's a big fan of Doctor Who. Okay, so basic parlance here, um, and this is kind of the fun part of making mage effects, um, is kind of figuring out how these things work. So in this case, 
Uh, we're calling it a cloaking device. It uses forces too, and it's uh, inside his backpack. Amp has installed a, an optical emitter, uh, and by reversing the polarity, he can create a distortion field that bends light around the area of the emitter, and anything that's within the five uh, foot diameter is obscured. Um, this. Let's find out what type of a effect this is going to be. This is a. Um, we're going to say this is more of a uh, standard feat. Um, the purifying audio, that's about getting like perfection and perfection is difficult, but this is, this is creating a, a invisibility field. Uh, you'd think that might be more difficult, but uh, in this case, it's not something that's perfect. The results don't make you completely invisible. It just uh, bends the light around that. So this would be, I think, akin to hiding or healing yourself. Even, I think this is about the same as conjuring a small fire or, or altering your own shape. So this is still going to be like a standard feat. So this is only going to require two successes. So um, we're going to put that into the notes here. Uh, that requires two successes. But this is a vulgar effect. Um, I don't care what technology you're using or um, how you explain it. Um, at this point in our consensual reality, something becoming invisible, even if it's through this technological means, is vulgar. So, and the base difficulty of this is going to be different than the Purify Audio. Because this is a um, vulgar effect at its base, the base difficulty is going to be higher. So... Base difficulty is going to be going to require two forces, and it's going to be plus four without witnesses, plus five with. So base difficulty will be uh, six, and then any modifiers we'll figure out at the time of casting. So, for example, Amp is working on a job, and he then comes across some very frightening dudes they're coming to uh, some technocracy agents have discovered that he is out and about and so uh, he wants to hide from them he wants to escape from them so he reaches into his backpack and he th starts um, fiddling with the uh, the optical emitter he wants to do this as quickly as possible and with as little uh, difficulty as possible so he's going to um, He's going to uh, actually spend some quintessence, lower the difficulty. He only has access to some personal quintessence of battery. So let's take a look at his stats here. He has... One in prime and nothing in terms of character creation that I've made that has an uh, avatar read. But I'm going to say he's able to channel one quintessence per round. So he's going to lower the difficulty from uh, six to five. Um, he's also going to take this opportunity to spend a willpower point so that he has um, one automatic success. What this will effectively do is that when he rolls his two uh, dice, he'll just have to get one of them to succeed um, for the effect to take place. And this will effect will only last for a scene um, based on the uh, damage and duration um, chart. So let us let's play through this scenario here. He is going to roll two dice with a target of five. He's because he's lowered the difficulty using quintessence. And he is going to um, 
utilize a he's got to spend a point of willpower to get an automatic success so he's got one success already he only needs one success on this roll so when we roll we get zero successes two threes unfortunately for amp he does not cause the effect to happen he's still fiddling with the device it's not working the way he is envisioned um he can opt to spend his next turn casting again but it's going to raise the difficulty from five to six again um actually from six to seven um and he can channel quintessence if he has it but he doesn't he's he only had one saved up so now he can't spend quintessence and his difficulty is even higher um, he still has that one success and he hasn't rolled any ones so there's no botches going on here um, but he has possibly this only one last opportunity before the technocracy agent turns the corner and realizes that there's a reality deviant that needs to be destroyed so now much higher stakes his, his difficulty is seven he's now rolling these two dice praying that he does not get caught and no success he rolls an eight but he also rolled a one that one subtracts that success away so at this point he decides to let go of the spell he cannot stay where he's at he's going to get noticed he decides that it's rather take the chance to sneak away using mundane means than magical or technological means and the spell fizzles now He didn't botch because he didn't have because he did have some successes he had that eight and he had the willpower but it was still a vulgar effect so he does still gain one paradox and that paradox will stick with him until such time that it gets dispelled When we're going through the game, of course, uh, this is going to be with the other players, and it's going to be a discussion between what they want to do and how they try to do it, and I will be there to help them through all of that and make sure that they use their spells wisely. Well, use their spells. They may not be wise. At this point, we've gone over and we've created a couple spells for our friendly Technomancer. We've used one of his willpower and we've uh, garnered some Paradox. I'm going to keep that on his permanent record here um, just because I think it's fun for characters to have some background before we even get to see them. Um, having some lived experience. Did Amp escape the technocracy? Eh, we'll figure that out. But he didn't do it through magic. And if those technocratic uh, forces have means of detecting reality deviants, then they may have picked up on his attempt to cast magic. Because he did get collect that paradox. And that does create ripples in the in the fabric of reality maybe he's hunted to this day we'll find out oops the other aspects of casting other aspects of mage like paradox and backlash and the more dangerous aspects I think is a big enough topic to cover at a different time but that's the basics of using magic in mage bit of a long rant some technical stuff 
Some things that you may not even understand until you see it in practice. Believe me, it's, it's not the easiest thing to grasp. But it's fun to play in the sandbox that Mage the Ascension gives us. That's why I love it so much. That freeform, you can do anything if you try. Realities like that sometimes as well. And you may fail. And sometimes it's worth it. And in Mage, you gotta push those boundaries. The rules are a little complicated, but they're they're succinct enough that we can measure our way through it. And again, as the storyteller, I believe in the rule of cool. I don't try to punish my players. I am always trying to make sure that they are having a good time and they are using uh, the tools that I can provide to the best of their enjoyment. With all that said, thank you for hanging out with me for this uh, Mage Monday. Um, it's been a blast. Um, I hope I'm not too boring. Uh, <laughs> I know this is some heady stuff, so sometimes it can be um, mouthy. But uh, we'll, uh, you'll see when the game's actually being played, this goes a lot smoother. And the ideas flow a lot better. And again, I'll be here to guide us all through it. So until next time, have a uh, magical week. I don't know. Do I have a catchphrase? Do I need a catchphrase? I don't think I need a catchphrase. I'm just going to leave it as it is. Um, I'll see you next week, and uh, pretty soon, next week or two, we're getting even more uh, mage plays, and we're going to be uh, broadcasting our first uh, episode. So I'm looking forward to that. I hope you are as well. I'm excited. Um, oh, I there's there's too much. There, I don't want to spoil it. I'm done. I'm done. We're done. That's it. We're done. Are we done? I think we're done. I'm done.